selling you this cup of iced coffee, right? I could charge whatever I wanted for it. If you're in contract with an insurance company, I can say, okay, I want to sell you this cup of physical therapy services and I want to charge $195 for that session. And they're going to say, no, if you want our clients, we're going to pay you $59 and you'll take it or you won't see our clients. You have found Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. Downloadable audio episodes can be found in the podcast link found at drawincustomers.com. We are locally underwritten by the Bank of Sun Prairie, Calls on Call, Extraordinary Answering Service, as well as the Bold Business Book. And today we're welcoming slash preparing, preparing to learn from Michael J. Silva, the business coach specifically for physical therapists. So Michael, how is it going today? It's going great. How are you doing, James? I'm doing well. So tell me, the physical therapist world... In my mind, that's for people that are old or broken, right? Is that? <laughs> yes. I am guessing that is incorrect. But... They are a uh, they are a frequent flyer of physical therapy services for sure. Right. Um, but physical therapy uh, spans the the whole lifespan from uh, neonatal to um, growing pain issues in um, toddlers, children, teens sports injuries, work injuries, and everything in between. Um, so that is a, a a common thing I hear all the time when people aren't familiar with physical therapy. Yeah. But, um, there's It's so much more. It's so much more than just, um, you know, old people breaking a hip and needing someone to teach them how to walk again. Um, but uh, yeah, we offer lots of great services to humans to get them out of pain, function better, relieve stress, all sorts of, all sorts of health promoting uh, services. So just for me, being the the guy that just doesn't know the whole scope that physical therapy includes, does it also include prevention or is yeah. it only let me help you fix once you're having a bad day? Well, if it was, uh, there's uh, many of us that are in the prevention side of things. So when I was a clinician, we, we kept preaching prevention. Um, I did a lot of work with runners over my career. So like my specialty, I worked with runners. So from high school to octogenarians from olympians to you know seven hour marathoners everything in between and what i realized is after trying to fix people's pains fix their fix their problems that if i just put together a program where i could address these common issues that we find in all runners before they get hurt maybe we can pre prevent injuries and improve running and that's what ended up happening so i have a whole business called run strong that i did that i created a class and it's a whole um like coaching platform that I do for runners and coaches to help prevent that from happening. Nice. The problem is when health insurances are involved, they're not big on prevention. No, they want to wait for you to get sick. And so they can give you a medication. They want to wait for you to get hurt so that you can have a surgery. Um, so we, we preach it and we, and a lot of people in the sports medicine, active outpatient world of physical therapy will have preventative services. But unfortunately for some people, it's an out-of-pocket expense because it's hard to justify that to certain insurance companies. Some are coming no. around though. Yeah. It's so interesting that you say that because I had a health insurance professional salesperson on the show. I don't know. It's probably right after the pandemic. I think it was um, still in the studio, but it was interesting talking with her because she's selling the health insurance, but from a personal point of view she's like i don't know why they don't cover prevention it's so much cheaper so people much cheaper. are healthier people are happier but in the end in order for them to build the big hospitals they need people that actually go to the big hospitals you know i i hate saying this but um there's a lot of money in sick people there is <laughs> there's, there's a lot money of money in to, yeah. there is and it shouldn't be called health care it should be called sick care you know oh, I, I love it yeah so true yeah it's just um you know, oh, trust me, we could go off for a whole episode just on this. But, you know, I started in the in, as a physical therapist in 1998 is when I graduated from graduate school. I was in fitness world before that from undergrad. So I've been trying to help people stay healthy and improve my, my whole career. And the, the woman you were talking to, the insurance salesperson is exactly right. Is what's that old adage? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, cure or whatever, whatever it is. Right. Um and if we could just educate and get to people before they get sick, before they develop the chronic back pain, before they develop diabetes, before they break their first bone, like just give them the, these small strategies and habits to form to better take care of themselves. 
I tell you, there'd be a lot less um, drugs being taken and prescribed to Americans. And then probably be a lot less money made in big pharma, but don't tell gotcha. them. Gotcha. <laughs> Interesting. That's crazy. That's scary that we we're still in that realm. It is, of, it is that's scary. Our priority. Yeah. Right. So tell me, how do you shift from having your own physical therapy practice to coaching people with physical therapy practices? Uh, that's a good question. So I had my practice for about, uh, I won't keep the story too long, but I had my practice for 20 years. So I started it early on. I was about two years into my career as a physical therapist. And I was getting, um, I didn't know the term back then, but it's a popular term in our world now is burnout. And I was yeah. unhappy with uh, what I was doing, right? I was I was working with the wrong patients that I wasn't passionate about. I was working for, you know, companies that just didn't see things the way I saw them. And I was just really unhappy doing that type of thing. So that's when I, my wife was also a therapist. We decided let's just start our own business, do it the way we like it. So we did that, grew it for 20 years and we had a successful business. I was about to open my fourth office before we sold. I had a team at some points up to like 25 employees and we helped thousands of people in our communities and we had really, it was really rewarding. And I loved doing all of that. And I loved um, helping people and improving their lives. I didn't like battling insurance companies, right? I didn't, also my hands took a beating. I was a very manual therapist. So I had my hands on everyone and mobilizing bones and tissue work, that type of thing. So my hands got beat up. I was getting a little physically tired after all, doing that for over 20 years. Um, and I saw the opportunity to exit, um, at that the time during the pandemic is when I sold. Um, the multiples were pretty good. There was a lot of money around and people were investing in PT. So I saw an exit where I could, um, you know, take some money, invest it other ways, and then be able to reinvent myself. Because um, it was fun. I loved it. I loved my team. But I think I needed personally to do something different. Um, so then after I sold it, I went through a little bit of an identity crisis, you know, because I was known as, you know, the running PT guy that had this business. Um so I got over that and then just through some conversations and soul searching, I knew I still wanted to help people. But now with what I'm doing, trying to help other therapists start, create, or or improve their private practices, I'm allowing them to help more patients. So I think in the long term, I'm, I'm still helping humans at the physical therapy level, but through my clients. That's fair. That's fair. You touched on a few things there that I want to ask you about. Little sure. tangents here. First one is you said the opportunity came about to sell when you're about to open up your fourth practice. Right. So that sounds like you're on the way to growth, but then someone, did someone come to you and offer you a bag yeah. of money or how did that work? Yeah. yeah. At that time, a lot, there was a lot of big, um, a lot of VC money and a lot of big money was coming in and, and buying up uh, PT practices because there is money to be made. Um, so I was, I was approached by a few different companies and, you know, I entertained some of the offers. I never entertained them previously. This has been going on for years. And it's not just because my practice was special. Many practices that showed any sort of history of success were getting approached and getting phone calls and emails. Um, and I ended up selling to someone who was, uh, it's a bigger practice now, but they were pretty local. Um, the owner knew me, I knew her, and we had a great relationship and it just felt like a good way for me to exit and to keep it within, you know, from the smallest state in the country, Rhode Island. So to keep it local was, was nice. Um, so just through some conversations and like I, I use the term, a lot of soul searching around that time. I figured let's, let's do it. Now is a good time. Um, and we were on our way up. We were, we were successful. You know, the pandemic kind of hurt business a little bit, and, but we survived. We came out of that. The numbers were going back up. Um, and I always think it's a better time to sell a business when you're doing well than when it's failing. Oh, yeah. um, so go out on top for lack of a better way to describe it. Um, and I think it helped. It helped the, you know, valuation of the, of the business and helped my exit a little bit better than if I was failing and just had to get out of desperation, which definitely wasn't the case. Fair. So how long did it take to, for you to negotiate with the buyer from the start of the talks to the time that you're giving them the keys and walking away? I'm going to, I mean, let me think about it for a second. It had to have been about nine months. Okay. Uh, so decent, but not crazy. No, no. It was, um, you know, I think, let me think. So we started conversations. It was over a year before we just started talking. And then when we really like had the LOI, it was probably about between six and nine months. I think from the time we got really official, you know, like lawyers and accountants and everyone was involved and, you know, moving beyond the LOI. So that was probably just over the six month mark, I would say. Okay. And was it tough to come up with a price? Um, 
because that's always the big deal, right? Right, right. right. No, you know, you got the practice, then there's goodwill and right, right. So, yeah, it's hard because you get, you know, as a business owner, you get a lot of emotions. And I know you have bought and sold businesses personally, right? So, I had a lot of emotion because this was like my family, my second life. So, but I was realistic about what my business was worth. I had given myself enough education and um, in my business and valuating businesses and had a good team on my side. So I was pretty realistic in the numbers that I would have, I wanted and what they offered were very, very close, if not spot on. So it wasn't right. like going back and forth. Of course, I wanted to maximize what I wanted for the business and they wanted to pay as little as possible. Um, but it worked out. I think it, um, I think it was a win-win for both of us, which is kind of rare in those types of opportunities. But I think it goes back to what I was saying because we had a really good reputation in this area, we had a solid staff that had been with us for a while. We had consistent um, patients. We had, you know, one of the lowest cancellation rates out of any clinic I've ever seen. Um, we had a really, um, we had a thriving business. It was a good cash flow. So um, that with the reputation and all the goodwill we put in, I think they saw that because they were a local company and they knew of us for the past 20 years. Whereas someone, you know, I entertained an offer from someone on the West Coast. They didn't know who I was or what I built and, you know, so I think uh, it, it worked out. It was it was much smoother than I would have expected because I know these things can be horrifying. Um, yeah. But that whole that whole for of course, there was some back and forth as expected, but it was nothing awful. I think we uh, we played well together. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So when you sold, did you have to stay on for a little bit to make sure the transition was okay? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Walking away. Yeah, I stayed on. Um, you know, I, I we had talked about keeping me on longer and doing some other things. Um, but after about, it was about nine, 10, 10, 12 months, about the one year mark, the transition was done, the rebranding, everything had happened. Um, you know, whoever was making changes and leaving and staying, everyone was stayed put. Um, so that's when I decided to um, to walk away at that point and do, right. and do what I'm doing now. All right. And the employees that you had, did they stay put or did they move or how did that work? Yeah, a lot of them moved, unfortunately. Okay. You know, um, I think... You know, change is hard for people. Um, and what I took as a huge compliment, and I didn't realize how like emotionally connected to the business they were and what we had built. Like they were re some of them were really sad and distraught about working for someone else and not for me. So um, yeah, I would like to say that they all stayed on and they were, you know, as happy as can be. But you know, some left. Some stayed. There's still a few left, but over it's been about three years now. Sure. And a lot of them have moved on. Um because you know the business is growing, it's becoming corporate, and they want to stay um, the, the small, the small business feel to um, their profession. So some of them moved on. I, okay. I wish they would have stayed. Some moved on way too soon, and they didn't even give it a chance. And I ah. tried to uh, trying to encourage them, but um, you know it's hard. I don't want. I can't force someone to do something, but uh, no, no, not at all. Especially with, with a big change like that, it's interesting because I think when you a sale of business happens, the employees don't necessarily know if they're going to be let go or if they're going to be, if there's going to be essentially besides your, the person signing the front of the check changing, nothing's really going to change. Like right. there's a lot of unknowns. Right. So sometimes I feel like employees just want to leave so that they feel like they have some modicum of control. Right. Whether that's right. And I, th and I think that was the exact case with a couple of them. They wanted to make the decision rather than decision made for them. With ours, it was definitely different because in the PT world is still, but at that point was really short staffed. So, I mean, there was plenty of business. No one was going to get fired, at least the clinicians. I don't think there was no plan to get rid of anyone at all because we had a pretty efficient um, team. Um, but I think just think the change, the, the things are going to be different, different patients coming in the door, different processes, the, the demands were going to be a little bit higher. Um, so I think that's what kind of scaled more for, versus not having a job. I mean, it's All a right. good time. The past, <laughs> past five to six years has been a good time to be a PT. You're not without work. You can get a job. Uh, they, they can actually call the shots in a lot of the situations. Fair. Yeah. Tell me, I want to shift gears and ask you, when you started your business, you had it going for 20 years. You were with your wife. Mm -hmm. So she was a physical therapist as well with you for 20 years. Correct. So you were married and in business with the same person. Yes. <laughs> I don't know how you do that, but congrats to you. That is amazing. I'll tell you what, I mean, you, you brought it up. So we'll, 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 we'll walk in that door. It, it wasn't easy at times for sure. You know, um, we raised two kids during this time as we grew this business. We both graduated together from the same PT school. That's where we met. Um, 
we're very similar in who we wanted to treat and what we did. Um, so there were times where it's tough because, you know, we're, we had our work stress and we brought that home and those were a lot of dinner conversations. I think we definitely scared my kids from going into healthcare. And he, my son who's grown and flown is the furthest thing from healthcare. And my daughter <laughs> wants no part of it, probably just from listening to us talk the whole time. And it made for, made for boring conversations, always about patients and pain and numbers. Um, but yeah, but if it wasn't for her, you know, she was silent and like a, like in the back, the back room, most of the years, cause she was home raising her kids. We wanted, she wanted to be there. Uh, we didn't want to just have her come to the business and hire a nanny. It was our choice that we wanted one of us home. Um, and then when she was done nursing our children, uh, so we have two, then I came home and we would split. She would go in one day, I would stay home with the kids and then she would go in another. So then we split roles and then we kind of all came back in. Then we came back in together and we had different offices. So we were at we weren't um, in each other's face all the time, which I th which I think helped because uh, it can be it can be a challenge for sure. I bet. I bet. Yeah. So you were both in different locations for a portion there. Yeah, for most of it, we had the one office for most of the years, um, and then after the kids were old enough and in school, and she started to regain some of her time, we ended up opening an office closer to our home that she ran. Um, so I obviously helped oversee that and get that going. And then she, um, we, we, we started a small group training gym that she took over and did more of the preventative stuff that we were talking about earlier. She didn't like fixing people's problems. She wanted to prevent them and keep people healthy and thriving. So we opened a small group tra training gym, which she ran. Then I took over that as one of our PT offices. So that was our third office. So we kind of had that, that delegation of roles, which was good. Dang, that is amazing. Kudos to you for doing that. Yeah, it was, you know, it was, uh, I'd love to say it was all roses, but that's a big lie. And anyone <laughs> listening who's, you know, in business with a significant other, it can be done. It's challenging. And I think through my wife's coaching, making sure that, you know, we have date nights where we don't talk about numbers and staffing problems and things like that, and actually just focus on ourselves and our family and take vacations. And, you know, because that's truly important. Like, I believe, and I, I use this coaching with some of my clients, like if you're not healthy, your business is not going to thrive. If you don't have good relationships in your personal life, your business is not going to thrive. So it's coaching the human, not just the business, as you probably know as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, almost more so. Right. I was just listening to Jim Rohn. He said something about you spend all your health to get wealthy. And then when you get older, you spend all your wealth to try to get healthy. again. It's crazy, right? Yeah, it's weird. It's weird. But there was a story... Can I share it? I'm going to yeah, by all means. So anyway, and this is a pretty famous story, but I don't know if you've ever heard it. It's it takes part. There's this like rich American businessman who goes on vacation and sees this local native in one of these like beachfront resorty type of towns. We'll call it in the Caribbean somewhere. And he sees this old guy go out every morning in his boat, goes to catch a few fish, comes back in, sells it to you know the local uh, seafood stores or restaurants, and then. He, his wife comes down, um, they sit on the beach and every afternoon he plays a guitar, he watches the sunset and he does this day after day. So the American goes up and says, Hey, you know, if you, uh, we got you a bigger boat and then we, we brought in some staff and we did this and did this and had this whole projection of how to grow this guy's business and get him to work hard, work hard, work hard. And then he, then he pretty much said, so what in 20 years I can retire and play my guitar and spend the afternoon on the beach with my wife. And I was like, Whoa, good point. Yeah. Right? It's yeah, not for all everyone. that to get what you already have. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, 20 years when you decided to sell the business, was, how did that conversation go with your wife? Because she was a part of it. Yeah, no, she was on board. She would have, uh, she wanted to unload it earlier than I did. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it was definitely, and she's so supportive. Like, um, you know, I was the face of the business just because she was home with the kids a lot. And I was out doing a lot of public speaking. So everyone knew the business as mine, but she was a big part of it the whole time. Um, and a few years before that, she's like, I think we need to like move on from this. And, um, cause, you know, we saw like healthcare and PT, the, it was struggling. I mean, there's, there's still money to be made. There's still successful businesses, but she was just concerned about the future of it and w definitely wanted to do things different. And she was definitely jaded with the whole health insurance conversation. Like we started out talking about. Um, so I actually kept it going for a few more years because I wanted to get the valuation up. I said, you know, we're not ready to sell now. We were too young when we, at that point too. And we just weren't ready personally, professionally, business-wise. So I ended up getting some extra training. Um, 
in, in, in the business world and prepared myself. I had like, I pulled myself out. I was the least revenue generating team member out of my whole team at the time when I sold. So I wouldn't be handcuffed to the sale. So I did a lot of prep work. Um, so she started the process, was on board with it the whole way, and then was supportive um, as we went through it. Nice. That's cool. Yeah. Now, is yeah. she doing coaching as well? So she's, yeah, she's a, a health and wellness coach. She does, uh, she, well, she does a lot of somatic work and like transformative coaching with people who are dealing with chronic pain and just struggling in life and trying to get out of a rut. Um, so she's doing that. And that's where she kind of took her, her PT and, and, you know, experience as a healthcare professional and is now doing that. And it's crazy because the amount of improvement she's seeing with her clients outside of our healthcare network and them telling us what to do has just been phenomenal. I mean, she's changing people's lives in a way she couldn't if it was going through the insurance because we didn't have a code for, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're doing. It was hard to bill for those things. Yeah, but she's thriving. She's doing great with her clients. It's it's, uh, it's fun to watch her. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's super awesome. So let's shift gears into the coaching itself for physical therapists. Actually, let me pause that for a moment. Sure. I want to ask you one more thing because this is interesting thing as getting through buying and selling businesses. I noticed that in some industries, there's a threshold where anything below that companies that want to buy, aren't really necessarily looking at you. But once you get over that, then everyone's looking at you. Right. Is, did you find a number like that with the physical therapy business? Yeah. I don't know the exact number, but just going through it and, and having these conversations over the years, like if you're a, a one practitioner type of business and you are the business, it's not very attractive, especially if you're looking to sell and exit. I had uh, a friend of mine who had her own business and she had had enough. She was my age. She's been doing it for almost 25 years as well. And she's like, I just want to get out. And this is after I sold mine. She's like, can you, can we talk? And then I had to like have a hard conversation about your business isn't worth anything without you. <laughs> like, yeah, it's a job. So you, you really have nothing to sell. So they ended up just liquidating everything, taking whatever cash they could from that and then moving on to another career. Uh, but yeah, there is. And I don't know the exact number, but I know smaller um, one office practices where the owner is really deep into patient care are not very attractive unless the the person is willing to stay on for years if they're younger. But if they're old, if they're in their 50s and on their way out of their career, they're not going to get many buyers. Uh, but if you got, you know, multiple revenue streams, multiple clinicians bringing in the money, multiple um, offices, then it starts to become really attractive. And then, as you know, like the, you know, as the EBITDA goes up, so there's the multiple. Um, EBITDA is a funny, funny thing. It's very... Um, it's an art more than a science I've learned. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> but I anyway, that's how... through, yeah. A few valuations with different people. And I remember one, I got a quote for valuation. This was years ago. And they said roughly between five and $10,000 to let you know what the business is worth. And I, I remember my dad always saying when, when it comes to buying cars or something like that, he's like, it's worth what someone's willing to pay for it. So it's one of those, oh, we could just throw a number out there and see if we get any buyers to find out because right. 10 grand for someone to tell you what price they to put on there. If they're not actually getting you a buyer, yeah, they're just pulling some arbitrary number out. Right. So it seemed, I was like, Ooh. And at the time that particular business was, I don't know, 100, 150, 180,000, something like that for 10 grand. That's a big percentage of that. Just right, to almost, tell us what it's almost worth, 10% right? of it just to tell you what it's worth. Yeah. I mean, it's not like you're selling whatever, I don't know, Facebook or something like that. It's $10,000 <laughs> to figure out what the price is worth. Facebook's worth a little bit more, right? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Where percentage would be a rounding error for, right. <laughs> for us, 10 grand. I was like, wow, that's a, that's healthy. So we didn't do that one. Well, that's good. Yeah. So interesting. Let's shift gears into the coaching now for real. Yeah. Tell me, why did you decide to stick with coaching physical therapists specifically versus just coaching any business? Yeah, so I started there because that's what I knew. You know, that was that was my life for so long. Um, and I think, well, I, I grew up, I grew up in a, a family business. My father owned, well, my parents owned a um, a beer and wine in Delhi that we grew up in. Oh, so fun! I, yeah, it was really fun, and I, so I knew that I knew that industry slightly. Of course, we helped. We helped. It was a family business. Um, they went, they sold it. So I kind of 
I think I got a little bit of the entrepreneurial bug just watching my dad do it. And he didn't do that till he was 55. He was an employee until he lost his job and had to do something and turned a, a dying convenience store into a, I think just over 2 million a year in revenue uh, business that he ended up selling. Wow. At 55, uh, he started that. Started at 55, sold it at a, in his seventies. And this is a, a Portuguese immigrant without a high school diploma. And he nice. did very well. Yeah, so he they retired comfortably. He unfortunately died a couple of years ago, um, but my mom is set. And um, anyway, that was inspirational. But I know that's what you're talking what you're talking about. So yeah, so I, what I knew is you know private practice, outpatient, sports medicine, physical therapy. That's what I did. Um, and physical therapy is going through um, you know some rough times. People are leaving the field. They're burnt out. They're getting yeah. If you if you if you want to if you're ever bored and want to read a lot of uh, negative press on profession just go on to like one of those reddit websites and go join a physical therapy group and like if you if you listen to those um forums you think that you know the physical therapy world is a giant dumpster fire and everyone needs to get out before it explodes wow. but it's not all right it's really not so i kind of i'm on this mission and i use the term i'm trying to save the physical therapy profession one private practice at a time because there are so many quality humans and caring physical therapists that are leaving because they just don't want to work for big corporate. They don't want to, they're sick of doing what they're doing and not even considering starting their own practice as an option. Because, I mean, it's not easy, but it's not difficult to do it. So I want to help people who are passionate about working with someone, especially if they have a niche and a, you know, an avatar that they really want to work with and they're passionate about it. Let's say, let's say, Say you're a PT and you love golfing and you want to work with golfers, helping people, you know, start a business with the golfer in mind and being able to enjoy going to work, provide a ton of value to a certain um, certain subset of humans and actually make some money doing it. Like it can be done. Um, I think people get so scared and I think, you know, they have this mindset, well, this, it's, not, it's never going to change. It is what it is. Um, so that's my mission is to, not only help people start and grow their practices, but people who are frustrated and not seeing that they can improve their practice, try to help streamline their processes, you know, look at what, what they're doing. Are they attracting the patients that they want to attract? Are they providing a good patient experience to make sure these people enjoy what coming to the clinics and they're not dropping off and canceling and no showing all their visits. So um, I think diving into it and really figuring out the why for some of these owners is extremely important. Um, and I want to be, I want to help and I want to be able to help the patients that my clients are treating continue to improve their lives. So I'm doing it this way. Nice. I love it. I want to ask you when you started your business, your business coaching practice for physical therapists, you had a physical therapy company, you sell it. Now you hang out your shingle as a coach. Yep. How hard was it to get your first few clients? Still hard. Cause this Still is new hard. For me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, so I've got a handful of clients right now, not enough um, to make it a thriving business, but I mean, it was hard. The first one fell into my lap. Um, I had considered starting consulting. My wife had told me, she's like, listen, you did it for 20 years. You, you did it successfully. You've got a, you probably forgot more than most people know at this point in your career. Like just, why don't you do it? And I'm a public speaker as well. So I love being in front of groups and educating. So I'm doing some of that along with it. Um, so as I'm considering it and starting to, to see what that looks like as a business. I get a call from uh, a friend of mine from across the country who has someone um, that wants to, in his later in his years, he's about my age, 50, needs to do some, make a change because his, he's losing his job and wants to start his own business. So that was my first client. You know, you know, he signed on for another contract. He's probably going to sign on for more. So he's finding huge value. And, you know, I had imposter syndrome when he first wrote me the first check for my services. I'm like, what is this guy paying me for? Like, what am I going to do? And then I actually used some of his quotes and in, in, uh, online because he said like the best money he's ever spent in his career was what he spent on me because, you know, not only just acting as a sounding board, but I've stopped him from making so many mistakes because he didn't know what he was doing. For me, it's just common language because I knew, you know, the processes you need to go to to start up a, a, a practice in your state, that type of thing. Um, so that one fell into my lap and I had a couple others as well. Um, but just trying to get out there um, through different means and let people know I'm doing it. Um, it's hard. So yeah, it's a, uh, I would like to say I'm, I've got a waiting list and people knocking down my door to get in there. Not yet. 
give it a few more months, there, and that's going to happen. There. This podcast will change all that. So let's You're going to change my world, James. That's why I'm here. <laughs> you know, it's interesting you're talking about the physical therapy world being a dumpster fire because it reminds me of the veterinary world. We answer phones for a lot of veterinary clinics and go to the trade shows and all that kind of stuff. And the veterinary clinics are getting bought by corporate. A lot of veterinarians are getting out. A lot of techs are getting out. I don't quite understand why they're getting out. I feel like it was kind of around pandemic time where people just started changing for whatever reason. To me, it's, and this is totally outsider looking in. Yep. So I have never been a veterinarian or I've taken, I've been on the other side of the desk with the dog, but <laughs> not on the actual fixing of the animals. You weren't fixing the dog. You were just bringing No, them. <laughs> no. I was just giving them a lot of money <laughs> to fix the dog. <laughs> so it's one of those things where I'm like, why are people getting out of this industry? Cause it's a growing industry. Like more people are populations going up and more people are making what I'm going to dare say less than great health choices. Mm-hmm. And population's getting older. There's just, I mean, I have a buddy's dad that's, uh, I don't know, he's over 80. Super nice guy, but every time I talk to him, he's got a different health problem that he wants to tell me about. Which, <laughs> fine, whatever. He's not just sitting there. Like, he's going to places and somebody's spending the money, whether it's insurance or whatever. So I feel like these are growing industries that the professionals in those industries that are serving the people are bailing out of. And I don't really understand why. So depends who you talk to, um, you'll get a few different answers, but a lot of it revolves around um, unattainable expectations from employers Okay. because cutting reimbursement. So like if I, if I was had a business and I was selling a product, I could charge what I wanted. If I'm selling you this cup of iced coffee, right? I could charge whatever I wanted for it. If you're in contract with an insurance company, I can say, okay, I want to sell you this cup of physical therapy services and I want to charge $195 for that session. And they're going to say, no, if you want our clients, we're going to pay you $59 and you'll take it or you won't see our clients. So yeah. So 80 for most, for most clinics, depending if you're an in-network with insurances or out of network or cash based, this is slightly different. But if you're, if you're primarily an in-network physical therapist, you get paid what the insurance company will tell you and you'd have no say. Every year, I'd have this fun conversation with the insurance companies. I'd call the liaison and say, hey, I'd like to renegotiate my contract. And they'd say, yeah, you'll take what we give you and don't bother me. See you next year. Yeah, it's crazy. So fortunately for us, we had a lot of self and (coughs) cash-based, excuse me, cash-based services. So we had another revenue stream, which I think made us um, as successful as we were because we weren't totally relying on that insurance-based income. So... You have the insurances are cutting reimbursement and they're making therapists jump through fiery hoops. Like we have to document for every minute we spend. If you were my patient and let's say you had, we're going to call it ABC Healthcare as your insurance. I don't want to use any real names. So ABC Healthcare says, okay, we're going to pay you X amount of dollars for a physical therapy. You can't use this code. You can't use that code. We don't cover for this. Make sure their copay is this. Um, I want to, in your coding, I want to see for every minute that you spend with that person what you've done and make sure it's billable. That's literally what we have to do to justify our treatments. Wow. Unlike a doctor's visit where you spend five minutes, they charge $350, they get it, and they just put a quick note in there. I don't know, I don't know why it's so different, but there's other, other um, services in healthcare that are similar. So you've got this re- the cutting reimbursement, an increase in the documentation needs and the justification for treatment. So now if you're working for a practice that says, okay, for us to be able to make money, you need to see 18 patients a day. Now to oh. see, and that, that's a little bit exaggerating, but I know people that some companies that will have their full-time therapy over 20 a day, which is not good healthcare. No. But the more, the more that, um, that profit has to be spread to different people, right? So the bigger the company gets, of course you can streamline the systems, become more efficient, but also everyone above you has to make a little bit of everything you do. And the margins are just getting less and less and less. So the demands are high, the stress is high. Um, it, sometimes it's unrealistic what they expect the therapist to do. And, they, and it, it's hard. Like it's a, it's a physical job, depending on what population you work with. Um, and it's emotionally draining. Like if you deal with pain, like literally for 25 years, I talked about pain and pe- what people had to give up or what they thought the best conversations when they thought they had to give something up, but we fixed them and they didn't. But, you know, 
they ended up in surgery, they had their knee replaced, they get their leg amputated, like all these huge life changing um, physical events that we have to help people with, it gets a little bit exhausting. It's rewarding, but it's exhausting. So now you add all that administrative load, the cutting and reimbursement, and also there's a ceiling. Like if you work for a clinic, you're a staff PT, then you can maybe run that clinic. And then for most smaller practices, if you have a couple of sites, there's really nowhere to go after that. Now, big corporate, okay, maybe you can work your way up, then you're a regional manager, district, whatever. Um, and not many clinicians want to climb that ladder. So they're seeing like, all right, this is going to be it for the rest of my career, treating 20 patients a day, documenting five hours every night while I'm trying to relax with my family because like documentation is really time consuming. So I think that's why a lot of the naysayers are saying it's a dumpster fire because of those aspects. Got it. My take on it is I think if you're really big, big corporate and there's some really big PT companies out there, they're so efficient. You know, they're at that scalable level where, you know, they can do more things and it's just more efficient for them to do it. Or I think the really small private practices are where you're going to thrive. It's that middle ground where we're seeing a lot of the struggle. Dang. That's yeah. crazy. Now I get it. Now I get yes. it. Interesting. I'll have to dig into the vet world a little bit more because I don't know if insurance gets involved. nearly. Not as much. There is insurance for vets. But it's funny you mentioned that because I was just talking to someone else in the exact same you know, the exact same conversation with me. He's in the business world. And, um, you know, it's becoming – Corporate corporations are coming in, buying up these vet practices, scaling, you know, integrating all their systems, trying to become more efficient, but it's becoming commoditized. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a little bit different when you deal with pets. I'm a dog guy, like you better treat my pet really well, but I think it's different doing that than dealing with the human, the sick human versus a sick vet. Um, and I know one of my neighbors here who was a really successful vet, I think he had two or three offices and he unloaded for a boatload of money and he's done. He's like, I've had enough. Nice. I'm assuming there's similar headaches in that we're talking about, but just slightly different. I would bet. I would yeah. bet. Yeah, I, I can understand the emotional toll. Yeah. That you you keep seeing illness or just negativity. And even if you can help them, that negativity is still the initial thing. Yes. People are coming to see you when they have a problem. Right. It's rare probably that they pop in and say, hey, everything's cool. <laughs> right. So this so is why... Sorry if I'm going off on a tangent here, but this is why when I started my business, I really wanted to work with health conscious, fitness focused type of clients. So we had really motivated people and we didn't have many people who were on their deathbeds or injuries that were so catastrophic that, you know, life would never be the same. It was more sports medicine type of things. But we also had so many cash based services and wellness type services. So people wanted to come in to get to use like our anti-gravity treadmill. They wanted to come in for a recovery service or to use our massage therapist or for just for personal training. So we kept that positive energy there. And then you had the person who was just in the car accident and broke their leg coming in in the walker and trying to learn how to move their foot again. So it helped balance it off a little bit. Um, but I think if people aren't creative and they're just in that, it is, it takes a, a certain type of person to be able to do that for many years. Like I think of doctors, like oncologists, God bless them. How can you just treat like dying people day after day and you know they're you can't save everyone like god bless them like thank god we've got people like that because i i don't know if i could do it at least not for long no i'm right there with you yeah <laughs> no it's one of those like there are certain jobs that i just glad there's someone to do them right i don't know why there are people that are willing to do that but but thank god there are <laughs> yeah it's i suppose it's like a i always think of the meter maid or someone like the parking meter giving you tickets and stuff like that. Like, I know that we need that. <clears throat> Whose personality was just like, that's what I want to do. I yeah. want to be the guy that just ruins people's day. Right. <laughs> just give them tickets. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I get, I understand we need it. So there's not parking in <clears throat> or anything like that. But on the flip side, somebody has to be like, yep, that's my job. That's it. And whether they love it or not, that's their job. And that's what they're doing. Yeah. It's interesting. All right, I get it. I get it. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, by all means. So I've met a lot of people from all different professions. This is out of the blue and I have any, sure. I don't have any idea how you're going to guess this answer, but there are two professions that in my experience, I've met the happiest people in the world. Oh, in my world. Okay. So the two professions, different professions. And we're not talking about like high paying multi-million dollar people who are just happy because they don't have to worry about paying their bills. These are like 
honest, hardworking people. But for whatever reason, 90% of these people, <laughs> excuse me, 90% of these people that when they came into my office and I met them were like the happiest humans I've ever met. Wow. What do you, what do you, what, what's a guess? Just throw something out there. This could be fun. I'm going to guess, and this is because I'm in Wisconsin, bartender. Um, and then I'm going to dare say massage therapist. Ooh, not bad guesses because both of them bring joy to people. right? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, mailman or postal worker. Really? I know. And you remember the old term of oh, someone's going postal? Going like, postal. Ed. That's a thing. Yeah. I tell you. And um, phys ed teachers. Oh, interesting. So <clears throat> the ones that I found that were the happiest, the, the postal workers are the ones that walked like in the cities and they just, you know, push their cart or they would park their car and they would walk. So they walked every day. And for some reason, I think just the amount of physical activity, they had just enough physical activity in their day to keep them healthy and thriving. They were also very social people. They interacted with their customers and they tend to be really just fun and engaging. And then the phys ed teachers, just think about it. They're out just playing games with kids, yeah. right? <laughs> Depending on the level, they're like playing soccer with kids every day. Like how fun is that? It doesn't right. seem terrible. Does not seem, seem terrible, bad. right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, for whatever reason, that just sticks out when people have asked me questions like that over the past and those two professions. Maybe that's going to be my third my, my third career. I'll get into one of those. <laughs> my <laughs> teacher. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I don't know. If that'd be tough. Just I'm thinking of dealing with what grades could you tolerate? Because although you'd be healthy, you'd also be deaf. <laughs> right. <laughs> And kids are changing too, so I think it's going to get a little bit tougher to deal with. The oh, kids. I have no doubt, no yeah. doubt. Yeah, absolutely. You had something I want to ask you about. What was it here? The fifties method. Tell me about that. Oh, the five O. The five O method. Okay. Five O. Yeah. So it's um, I might rephrase it because a lot of people it's it's hard to see it in writing. Yeah. But it's basically the five pillars of how um, I think people need to approach if they're starting a business and to okay. start their thought process. It's like my ten thousand foot view. Um, of what you need to do. And it's revolving around, and they all just have, we use O words to to target each one of those five pillars, but it just helps people focus on like, who's their object. So their target audience, you know, really think about who the object is, owning the processes in your business, you know, building the structure of the business. Um, God, I got to drink more of my coffee. I'm drawing a blank on the other O's, but basically it's the five and it's, it's like a 12 page ebook that I have and I'd be more than happy to share it with anyone if they wanted it. But it's, um, it just goes over the basics of starting a business, not going right to, cause I think people put the cart before the horse sometimes, but like, who do you want to serve? How are you going to serve them best? How are you going to over deliver on the value that you're going to give them? Right. Get, get help getting the processes to make sure you've got a solid process because everything's going to be better at that point. And I can, I can probably argue that it's nothing, for someone like you who's been in the business world and coach business owners, you know, Rita, let me know what you think, but it's pretty, it's a basic level just to get people who um, haven't done it before to open their eyes a little bit about, you know, these five key pillars, in my opinion. No, that's fair. That's fair. I run into those people all the time. I just had a guy uh, looking to rent an office space and he asked me, he's like, what is an, uh, the difference between an LLC and an EIN? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah that's where you are. And I helped him describe right. it, but it was one of those, like, I haven't had to answer that question in a very long time. Right. And it was very interesting how he's like, I looked online, I don't get it. All these acronyms. Right, right. And it's so because, much, yeah. It's funny because it's, it's a conversation you've had and something you've known just because you've dealt with those two acronyms forever. But yeah, for, for someone new, they just don't know that. No, no, there's no, I don't know of any manual. And I, yeah, we got audited by the state, um, I don't know, six months, a year ago, something like that. And I remember joking with the lady, joking, right? With the state lady. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got audited for employees and all that kind of stuff. So I knew we weren't doing anything <clears throat> wrong. So there's no worry that way, but the amount of paperwork that they asked for was just insane. Right. And to me, I'm not in the world of dealing with insurance and stuff like that. So paperwork just stacks up on my desk and I try to get somebody else to do it. Right. 
So I said, you know, what's interesting is that you guys are really good at telling people that they're doing stuff wrong, but you haven't told me how to do it right. So I feel like you're, you're kind of in somewhat of a hypocritical role here. Because like, if I'm doing something wrong, by all means, let me know. But then you got to tell me because I'm going to keep being in business. Wh how do I do it correctly? Right. There's nowhere in a lot of situations and a lot of areas where people can go and say, this is how you're supposed to do stuff. So why do you think they're not, they're not telling you how? Uh, uh, speculating. Yep. I don't know for sure. But I would guess that in something like a government thing, there are so many people. Uh, they don't know. Right. The I mean, even just the uh, the tax code itself. We're talking hundreds of thousands of pages. No one person can mentally or even physically read that many pages. No. So no one person knows. So if that's the case, which it is, how can someone say necessarily for sure that you're doing mm. something wrong if they don't even know how to the do it right? of the rules of the game, right? Right. I think of like if we were going to play Monopoly and the Monopoly directions were 500,000 pages, <laughs> be like, hey, when you land on Park Place, this has to happen. Right, right. Like, well, are you sure? Mm. No, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Right, right. Is I got to check hundreds of thousands of pages versus just a, a sheet? Right. I guarantee many people would not be playing Monopoly if that was the case. Right, right. But well, here we are, right? So right. it's interesting because I asked her, I'm like, if I'm doing something wrong, just tell me. Great. Fantastic. How do I do it right? Because I thought that I was doing it right. Right. And uh, I, didn't hear back answer. From I didn't hear back. No, too bad. She said, she said, we'll let you know whatever. And I didn't hear anything back. So I assume no news is good news. Right. So was, was the, if you're not comfortable sharing, don't share, no, but was, was there a fee involved or a fine that you had to pay? No. So it's not even, a, it's not even like, Oh, we're making money. If we don't tell this guy, Nope. they just didn't know the answer. No, nope. it was a, it was a employee audit to make sure I didn't have any subcontractors or anything like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I have all employees. So I'm like, I'm definitely paying taxes for the employees. <laughs> um, so I didn't, and I gave them all the information from the payroll stuff. They asked for general ledger. They asked for, I didn't even know what a general ledger was. I've been in business for a long time. <laughs> I looked at that document and we're talking pages, right? It goes back right. years. And all I could think is who in the world is looking at this? Cause I'm small business, tiny business, right? From a, a scalable, like when I look at the Facebooks of the world, right? Trillions of dollars. I can only imagine what their general ledger looks like. And this document was pages. <laughs> it was hundreds of pages. Yeah. And I'm like, who are we paying at the state that's going through this thing? And what is right. best case scenario for what they're going to find that I may be doing wrong? Best case to even justify this. Well, they're going to collect taxes on one person they claim was a subcontractor, right? Yeah, I guess. I guess it was just a weird like, <clears throat> man alive. I get it's same thing with the, the parking meter person, right? Somebody has mm -hmm. to have that job. Right. But I feel like <laughs> it takes a certain type of individual that's odd. But whatever. I mean, that's that's the world we live in. Right. It is, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, tell me, when you are coaching people, is it a one shot, one meeting, done, move on with your life? Or is this a routine once a week, once a month? Yeah. So I, th I find it hard. I I do have a service where they can just pay me hourly and act as a sounding board, or if they just have one situation. Um, and I've got a person on the other on the other coast in California that uses me um, in that way. But what I like to do is if you know we figure out what's going on with the business, what are their goals, you know, what are the things getting in the way of them meeting their goals, and I come up with a a rough idea of how it what we need to do to get there. So it's almost like as a physical therapist, I'm going to assess, diagnose, and come up with a treatment plan. So I do the same thing for the business. So we assess diagnose, come up with the treatment plan, what's your lowest hanging fruit, this is what I think we can do together. And then if it's a three month plan, then they sign on for three months. And typically depending on their needs and their location, um, and a lot of what I'm doing is virtual, so I don't go in person as, as much as I'd like. Um, but there will be a weekly, weekly phone or virtual meetings. And then I do have someone who's um, pretty local, 
it's a little bit of a drive, but he's in New England that I go to. Um, and every month I do an on-site with him. And then it's uh, through email, text, or phone call support in between just being there. You know, this guy was just opened his doors in his business. So there was a lot of last second. What about this? What about that? This person? How about this? So, and I was there as a resource for him through the whole thing, which was great. Um, I personally think it's hard to make, you know, a change in a person in a business in one month. You know, it's hard to get people prepared to open a business and be the leader they want to be and learn how to hire and fire and all those other things and set up the processes and the five O's and all that. So I would love to work with businesses for six to 12 months. Um, but I have the three month option. And if they want to pay hourly, which is not um, financially is not the best choice for them because they'll get a lot more value with a longer, but you know, some people are, are scared and uh, to invest a certain amount into their business. And even though you can show them the numbers and what they'll get in return. Um, so I work with them, you know, if they want to just sign on for the month and then we can put that towards a three or six month package down the road. Um, but that's how I like to do it and really get to know the person. I want to get involved I don't want to get so emotionally involved in their business that I get the the emotional blinders on, like ah. you would if it's your own business. But I want to make sure, like I've got, if I'm when I work with my clients, I've got buy-in. Their success is my success. So I think of developing a good rapport with them, really getting to know them as the human. Um, I think it takes time. So I would say three months would be my minimum ideal to work with a client. Okay. Well, tell me, you mentioned burnout towards the beginning. Yep. How do you? train or prevent your clients from getting burned out in their business right so a lot of it comes down to depending on the person a lot of it comes down to who who their ideal client is so a lot of people experience burnout because they're working with a, a customer we'll call them customers because even in healthcare they're they're paying a lot of money for the services we're going to call them customers so that's not the ideal customer. They're just taking everyone and anyone in the door and they're trying to be the the Walmart and where they can, you know, just do everything. Um, and not and I don't think you can do everything really well. And I don't think you should be, I don't think everyone should be your customer. I really think if you had um some a, a, an area of focus that you're passionate about. So I talk to people about what are you passionate about? Like we mentioned earlier, like if you're a golfer. You know, let's 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 work on that. Do you want to work with golfers? So how can we get you more golfers in? Right. So then we talk about um, the five O's and how we can build a practice around the golfer. So I think that's a big part. People just burnt with that. And then just streamlining processes right now. AI is scary a little bit, but it's I mean, in healthcare, it's going to become a, a life changer for people. Because using AI to help do a lot of the documentation and a lot of the administrative load will help lower the cost. So if we can lower the administrative cost, maybe give the therapist a little breathing room to do some documentation using AI in a more efficient way. Now they've got that, um, you know, we talked about the uh, unrealistic demands of seeing so many patients and trying to get the paperwork done. And, you know, if, if we could get our therapist to not take their paperwork home and use better efficiencies or better scheduling or AI to help streamline all that so they can go home and actually spend time with their family and they worked with the clients that they wanted and they're in a you know a, a mutually a culture that they're they resonate with i think burnout could be prevented for sure there i love it i love it i got one more question for you michael yeah and this is one that i run into when i was doing business coaching and i asked um uh, i asked the psychologist the same question so i'm curious about you when you are meeting with someone, I imagine you have a set time, hour, two hours, whatever it is. Yep. And my experience was it took a little time for people to warm up and then they got jabbering, but that clock was still ticking. Eventually that clock hit the time when you got to cut it off. Right. And I personally was terrible at cutting it off. A one hour session would turn into a three hour session and I would barely say a word. Uh, how do you cut it off like that? I'm on your team, man. It's hard. Um, it's really hard because I think it really depersonalizes a relationship that I'm trying to build with my client. So fortunately right now, I can build in some buffer room. It's not like when I had my clinic and I was patient, 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 stacked every 30 minutes. So I build in buffer room to allow that to happen. But if it, you know, if I, if I have to go, I have to go. And then I just schedule another meeting. I am, I'm, I'm probably not the most efficient of coaches and I probably over deliver. And, and I, that's my, 
I can't help but do that and provide more value than they're paying for. So I don't have a great answer. It's hard. Um, but I think just giving myself that buffer helps. And I haven't, haven't had too many situations where I'm like, done, got to go. Er. <laughs> right. See you going. next week. Was that, was yep. that, did I answer the question? Absolutely. Yeah. So you do, and how, I, how do you do it? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, I was the same way. I just ended up stop being doing business coaching. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was one of those, um, for me, I felt like I was trading time for money. Right. Which in my world is a not great exchange. Um, and I ran into a lot of clients uh, that would love to pay for advice, but they didn't necessarily implement or take that advice. That's frustrating. And so they would still pay. They still pay. They still meet once a week, once a month, once a quarter, whatever. And you'd say at the beginning of the session, right? Okay, here are your, let's say, three things that we talked about last time. And here are the steps. Let's talk about one. Did you do that? No. Two? No. Three? No. And did anything change? Excuse, no. Excuse. <laughs> I'm like, I can't have that. No, that's frustrating. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to take your money. That's cool. <laughs> but I'm not, I didn't feel fulfilled. Right. Because there were a lot of people and then the, the their struggles would keep going. I'm like, well, that's no good. Because someone's going to be like, hey, how's your business going? And they're going to be like, terrible. And they're going to be like, aren't you using that James guy for coaching? <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's great. You must suck. <laughs> but it's like, well, how can it be great if your business is doing terrible? Right, so right. So I didn't want to be connected to that. So then you start trying to get rid of clients. And I'm like, you know what? This ain't, it's just not my jam. I enjoy it. And I still do some pro bono stuff where I just help people out, especially new businesses. But for the most part, I don't, I don't push it because I, yeah. I was terrible at the clock there. Terrible yeah. at the clock. Yeah. And it was just, so that's always a curiosity thing to me because I joked with the therapist that, was, um, that I had actually on the podcast. I joked because I'm like, you're talking to people about suicide, crazy depression, anxiety, all this stuff that from my point of view is going to be a higher level than selling widgets, their business, right? Business is a big deal, huge deal, mm -hmm. but I'm talking to people about how to market or how to sell or how to deal with employees and stuff like that, which is not necessarily life or death, right? Somebody that is actively slitting their wrists. I don't want to be like, well, time's up. I got another appointment in five minutes. Put a bandaid on that. We'll talk about it. next <laughs> yeah, week. Just, <laughs> and she was just like, there's a clock when it dings, session's over. Yeah, that's tough. And I'm like, all right, well, if you can do it. <laughs> then you should be able to. Yeah. And I, I still have a very hard time with that. Yeah, so. yeah, same, same. And you know what, too, real quick on that. So, you know, when I started my profession, it, it was time trading time for money. Like as a service provider, it's like, okay, how many patients did you see? This is what you expect you to see. Here's your salary. And then when I got when I started the business, I was seeing more patients than ever to grow the business. But then I started enjoying reaping the benefits of being a business owner. And you know, I wouldn't I hadn't worked Fridays for nine years, and I you know I could go to have a lunch date with my wife, and and I still had revenue coming in, so I wasn't as much of an exchange for time for money. So now now here I am reinventing myself, and I'm back to the time for money. So <laughs> I do have a hard time with that. <laughs> I'm still finding value, and it's not overwhelming, and I don't need to work as hard as I did you know, 25 years ago when I started in the profession. Um, but yeah, it's true. Like exchanging time for money is tough and cutting people off when you're trying to over deliver and provide value is tough, but thankfully no one's um, in a mental health crisis with what I'm doing. <laughs> At least not yet. <laughs> Hopefully no, I, you know, that. I will say that when I was doing more coaching, there was very few things that felt as good as a client coming in and saying, James, I took your advice and holy cow, it was amazing. Da, 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 all the good stuff. Right. Because I'm like, yay. Because <laughs> <laughs> no then you deal. think like, what did it take me to learn that lesson that I taught them? It took me 10 years, probably $50,000, like wow, all this right. stuff. Right. So like That was money well spent on their end. And they're the ones that actually implemented it, took the advice. So kudos, high fives all around. It was fun. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a win right there for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So I like that. Love that part. But right. it didn't happen enough. I, it was a lot of, I didn't do that. But I imagine with physical therapy, maybe there's people who are just like, hey, did you do your exercises? Yeah, no. <laughs>
it's, I mean, that's a, unfortunately a big part in that for me, that's why I was burnt because I was working with a population that didn't want to get better, you know, and oh. not that they don't need the help, but I was a sports medicine guy. I was a former athlete. So I want to get people to thrive physically and they're coming in, not doing anything, lying to me. A lot of them just didn't want to go back to work. So they were, I hate saying it, but they were dragging on their recovery so they could have the summer off. We used to call oh. it, we used to call it, they saw Dr. Summer off. <laughs> that was the name. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's awesome. But, you know, so I didn't, I really didn't enjoy that population. And when I started working, so most of my career was in with runners and they're the most motivated people on earth. So now when I started working with runners and my schedule was filled with some days, a hundred percent runners, literally like 75 to 80% of my clientele were runners. You know, I spent more time saying, no, no, you don't need to do that 10 times a day, just twice a day. Or you don't need to do that seven <laughs> times a week. Just do it once a week. Like they were so over motivated and doing too much, trying to pull the reins on them was a totally different um mindset um but i enjoyed that more than people who complained about something wanted change but wouldn't change you know it's okay to want it but you gotta change in order to make that happen right, um right. so that's why i had that's why i i think i survived in, in my profession as long as i did because i had great motivated clients and hopefully with my business coaching i'm getting that i think hopefully the universe is going to provide that same type of clientele for me that's the name of the game yeah yeah, I think it would be fun to work with people that were that motivated. Right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Ooh. On all aspects of whatever. I mean, it's just a more positive environment, and they are their growth mode. It's way more right. fun to chat with people in growth mode. Absolutely. I love it. Well, Michael, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, James. This was a fun conversation. You're, you're, a, you're a great host, and you're uh, easy to talk with. This was fun. Well, it makes it easy when I have a good guest, so I appreciate your time. All right. Awesome. Michael, where can people find you? So um, michaeljsilva.com. And uh, my last name is S-I-L-V-A. I am from New England. And I sometimes forget to put R's in words. But a lot of people think my last name is Silver. And I just call it Silva, but it's not. So uh, michaeljsilva.com. Um, I'm not super active on social media, but I am on LinkedIn providing some um, content on there. And you can look up Michael J. Silva um, Consulting on LinkedIn as well. Nice. I love it. This has been Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. My name is James Kademan, and Authentic Business Adventures is brought to you by Calls on Call, offering call answering and receptionist services for service businesses across the country on the web at callsoncall.com. And of course, the Bold Business Book, a book for the entrepreneur in all of us, available wherever fine books are sold. If you're listening to this on the web, if you could do us a huge favor, give us a big old thumbs up, subscribe, and of course, share it with your entrepreneurial friends, especially those that either need to visit a phys physical therapist or have a physical therapy business. Michael is their man. We'd like to thank your wonderful listeners as well as our guest, Michael Silva, the business coach for physical therapists. Michael, can you tell us that website one more time? MichaelJSilva.com Awesome. Past episodes can be found morning, noon, and night at the podcast link found at drawincustomers.com. Thank you for joining us. We will see you next week. I want you to stay awesome. And if you do nothing else, enjoy your business.